book of Cana announcing the birth of Wolfgang Cana on March 5th, and on behalf of your many friends here, we extend congratulations to you and your wife. The subject tonight is training the foreign language teacher, so without much further ado, Dr. Hayden. Indeed, this is the last evening that you are going to have to put up with my bad. English pronunciation, and now that you have an authentic American citizen in the family who speaks American just as well as it is German. <laughs> uh, talking about uh, teacher education and preparing, uh, especially to talk about this subject, I found that actually I haven't uh, anything to say, which is kind of a problem for me right now. Uh, why I don't have anything to say is that there are so ex such excellent uh, guidelines and ideas that have already been printed and published in this country about teacher education, teacher education programs. Uh, especially, I would think of these guidelines uh, for teacher education programs uh, that have been published, I think, especially by the MLA, the Modern Language Journal of October 66, or uh, a publication like this one, The Education of the Modern Foreign Language Teacher for American Schools, a uh, study based on the various NDEA foreign language institutes and uh, the results for uh, foreign language teacher preparation that could be drawn from these institutes. So I think the only real contribution that I can make to this subject tonight is to tell you a little bit about uh, the program as we have it. I see. Was I supposed to stand back there? Sorry. Thank you. Excuse me, sorry, here in front. Uh, the only real contribution that I can make is to tell you a little bit about the program as we have it at home. At home meaning especially uh, in the state of Bavaria. We do have uh, independence of the various uh, German states in uh, educational matters. But uh, this program is not entirely different from the program in other states. It's only, it happens to be the one, of course, that I'm best informed about. Uh, after talking about uh, my own experience, I'm planning to pass a few critical remarks about this education, what I feel should not be imitated from it. There are certain uh, points, and uh, you are going to find some more, and I'd like to have you ask any questions that you want to at the end of our talk. And then uh, finally, I think I will uh, give a few impressions that I have got here during my stay in this country about the teacher education program as I saw it here. Before I talk about uh, teacher education in Germany, I think I must say just a few words about our German school system, which is so entirely different from your system here, that it is very apt to be misunderstood, and as a matter of fact, wherever I have tried to explain it, I get certain reactions that I'm going to mention as we go. Uh, reactions that come from the fact that it is so very little known and that it is so entirely different from the school system here. This little sketch uh, tries to give you a certain impression. Uh, let me explain what it means. We have 12 years of uh, school age for every youngster, at least partial schooling, from the age of 6 to the age of 18. All uh, children, all youngsters must go to some kind of school or another. At the beginning, as you can see very clearly, they are all together in exactly the same school, the Volksschule, elementary school it could be called. In some states, in some uh, Länder, this goes up to the sixth grade, for example in Berlin, West Berlin that means. <coughs> At the age of 10, that is to say after the fourth grade, the parents make a decision uh, whether they want to have their uh, children go to the same school for a number of uh, several more years or whether they want to uh, send them to a specialized kind of school. Similar decisions can be made, as it has not been indicated on this sketch, after the fifth uh, grade and then uh, after the sixth, seventh and eighth. Uh, how do these schools compare? I think uh, they can be called as efforts to get homogeneous grouping of the students. We feel, I personally feel, that even uh, at the beginning of uh, formal schooling, 
the children are so different that it's very hard to fix an exact date when all children are ready for school. I think the age for some children can be five, for others it can be seven. And research has shown that this uh, variety of different achievements becomes even wider uh, as they go on and when they reach the fourth grade and when they have finished it, some actually are at a third grade level and others uh, could be going to a sixth grade class after that. So we are trying to uh, keep account of that and to have special uh, kinds of schools for special uh, uh, students. For example, uh, we have the traditional gymnasium, which begins right here. It's uh, the uh, Altsprachige Gymnasium, or the humanistic uh, gymnasium. Uh, gymnasium, I should really say, because gymnasium is an entirely different thing, of course. Um, where they begin uh, with uh, Latin as the first foreign language, and now usually add uh, English as the second, and either Greek or French as the third. Then they have different kinds of gymnasium, uh, advanced schools, secondary schools, I think would be the best uh, way of translating this term, uh, where they have uh, English as the first foreign language, and then have different choices uh, going either uh, to mathematics and science in one branch, uh, beginning with grade uh, nine, or they go to a more linguistically emphasized type of school, then there are intermediate schools, there are some uh, kind of gymnasium that begin with students that are 12 years old. There are intermediate schools beginning at the age of 10. There are intermediate schools beginning uh, uh, with, for students at the age of 13, and so on and so on. Of course, I cannot tonight go into all these details. The main idea is uh, different from the basic axiom of American education as far as the high school is concerned. If I am well informed, the idea is that the youngsters feel at home, most of all, with youngsters of the same age group. This is uh, a little bit uh, different in Germany because there is possibly a little bit more emphasis on certain academic skills and understanding. And as these things are so much more important, or to a degree more important, we feel that it is important for the children to be in a homogeneous group, that is to say, to be together with children where they feel they can do about the same kind of things. As a matter of fact, we do have the problem, of course, you get it in any class, of some students being able to follow a certain course more easily and others having more difficulty. And we try not to give these students the feeling that for years and years and years they are always the worst uh, members of their class. Uh, we give them a chance to repeat this uh, particular class. I understand this happens very rarely in the American system. One school I visited uh, last week uh, had about 1% of students who were repeating one class. That happens uh, more frequently at home. As I said, with the idea of giving these students a chance of feeling at home, uh, one with the uh, students in the same class and two with the subject matter and with the understanding that they're expected to have for certain things that are taught in these classes. Uh, so it's the homogeneous group uh, with a group of uh, similar patterns of classroom behavior that we are trying to get. It is uh, this uh, class uh, of equal achievement, or more or less equal achievement. Uh, we, you might put it perhaps this way, that we feel that in splitting up these uh, students, you know, the, the reaction I, that we usually get when we explain the German system of education is, but that's so entirely undemocratic. Uh, and I try to, say, to point out that uh, actually there is no social background in that. You can get uh, the sons of very simple farm laborers, sons and daughters, of course, of very simple farm laborers going to the gymnasium, and the sons of, let's say, uh, medical doctors going to a very elementary kind of school, if not remedial school. It's funny that, uh, even that uh, quite often the sons of medical doctors are uh, failures at school. I don't know why. It's an observation that we have made. I think uh, one reason may be that the uh, father is so tied up with his job and has so very little time, especially because the uh, doctor in Germany usually visits his patients at night. He never has time for his uh, son or daughter. And I think that uh, uh, creates a certain kind of problem. So uh, this uh, is uh, the 
school system that I'm planning to speak about, and especially uh, my own experience will be the preparation of teaching in a gymnasium that goes from the 5th to the 13th grade. Actually, this is a little bit, a little bit misleading. We have uh, 13 grades. This would be 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And after the 13th grade, uh, the students at the gymnasium pass a final examination, and um, then they are ready to go to the university. I'm a teacher at a gymnasium in Fürth near Nürnberg, and uh, I'm going to tell you now a little bit about this uh, preparation that I went through. I mentioned it briefly in response to one of the questions the other day, but I want to go a little bit more into detail today. I myself uh, attended a gymnasium, and I started uh, English at the age of 10, uh, Latin at the age of 12, and French at the age of 16. That is to say that uh, by the time I passed my Reifeprüfung, my Abitur, my uh, final examinations of the gymnasium at the age of 19, I had had uh, nine years of English, seven years of Latin, and three years of French. Actually, four years. Four years of French. Uh, this, uh, I feel, is uh, one of the very essential parts already of teacher preparation for foreign language teaching. You should try and give a future language teacher a chance to study the foreign language himself as early as possible. And I certainly believe in starting foreign languages at the elementary school, uh, possibly already at the uh, fourth grade, as is being done in some school systems uh, in this region. An another part uh, of uh, my general schooling that I got that I would feel is in especially important in preparing me for my uh, work as a teacher is uh, the a number of courses in world history that we got. Usually at the gymnasium, we give our students two courses, two complete courses in history, starting from early history and going to modern times, once from grades 5 to 9, and then from grades 10 to 13. And I think uh, the problem here actually is, with all history teaching, that uh, necessarily this uh, teaching of history is centered on the history of our own language community. And I think this is a problem that I'll have to come back to a little bit later. My university training, my personal one happened to begin in this country at Hamilton College after my uh, uh, graduation from high school, from gymnasium, uh, but that is uh, not an essential part of it. Uh, the university training that German students who are planning to be teachers GIT consists of three main types of activities. The one is the attendance of lectures, Vorlesungen. The second is the attendance and participation in seminars. And the third is the participation in Übungen, exercises, practical exercises. The lectures uh, were centered on the three main fields, philology, meaning especially literature, the study of the literature of uh, England, of America, uh, and then, of course, of France. My subjects were English and French at the university. The second part would be linguistics, uh, of which uh, the emphasis, of which part of the emphasis was on uh, the history of language developments. This part of uh, linguistics is still considered as very important because we feel that you uh, can understand a language at least to a certain degree by knowing its history by knowing how it came about. Uh, you can look at a language historically and you can look, look at it also um, synchronically, that is to say, look at the language as it is at a given moment, for example, at the present time. But I think uh, certain uh, aspects of language can be explained only by a knowledge of the history of the language. Uh, the sound changes, for example, from Latin to French are very thoroughly studied. The semantics, the changes in semantics, the changes in morphology, historical syntax, and all these things are studied quite thoroughly, a little bit too thoroughly, perhaps. Phonetics is another field of uh, important studies uh, in a course, or in a, the training of a future uh, linguist or foreign language teacher. I should say that there is not very much of a difference in the training of a future linguist or a future foreign language teacher. The uni universities indeed refuse to be uh, places where 
you train somebody for a certain profession. It is a subject that is uh, being discussed at all times, and which right now is uh, uh, under discussion again because of the uh, certain uh, problems that we have in Germany. Here is an article that I clipped from uh, 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 a Christian Welt edition in January in 1968. Studium ist keine Berufsausbildung. To study is not being trained for a certain job. The idea is that the jobs they in themselves, in our modern world, change so often that uh, it is more essential to train a student to know what to do in a given job and how to acquire the knowledge and the skills for that job rather than just teach him the skills for one particular job and then when that job should uh, change, when the requirements for a certain job should change uh, in the course of time, he would be left alone with uh, guesswork. Uh, I think that this is a point of view that can be debated and possibly there should be some more emphasis on professional training in the university. There is very little of it. Modern linguistics are not emphasized, in my opinion, as much as they ought to be. I was fortunate in having one teacher who uh, had uh, himself studied under Ferdinand de Saussure in Geneva and uh, who was a uh, very strong uh, defendant of this system, but I understand that in most universities, modern linguistic structuralism has not yet found the uh, echo that they should have. Also, the courses in foreign civilization, foreign culture, Landeskunde, as we say, uh, avoiding the term culture in German because we feel that really uh, this term uh, denotes something entirely different, Landeskunde, uh, was not taught as much as I feel it could have been taught. Again, it was a matter of uh, being shown uh, how to go about acquiring knowledge uh, on your own, rather than uh, having everything spoon-fed. The uh, main emphasis was on history, and as I remember it, especially on the history of Parliament and similar political institutions. So much about the... Um, uh, lectures, the Vorlesungen. In the seminar, uh, in the lectures, uh, the student just sits and takes notes. In the seminars, uh, on the other hand, he is expected to do some original research. I think I'm saying quite a few things that you are taking for granted about your own school system. I'm just trying to give you a more or less complete picture uh, of uh, the training of a teacher. The research in the seminars would again center very heavily on literature. You would uh, try and prove your ability to evaluate literary works of art by applying sound judgment of your own and also by using what we call secondary literature, that is to say any literature that may have been written, any research that may have been published about uh, great works of literature. There are also seminars in linguistics, again uh, with the same kinds of emphases that I mentioned a moment ago about the lectures. Certain universities, I think most of the universities, have the system of uh, handing out Seminarscheine, uh, seminar uh, certifications, perhaps, would be the idea. Uh, the professor who gives you one thereby certifies that you have been in, uh, uh, pre uh, present with these uh, seminar meetings and that you have done some kind of research, of minor research of your own. Uh, the, uh, uh, title of the paper would be stated in this certification. And uh, you have to have a certain number of these seminar, China seminar certifications, if you want to go into an examination. I mention this because I feel that this is the closest that we ever get to what you call the credit system, which otherwise does not exist in German education, neither at the uh, secondary school nor at the university. In the exercises, in the Praktischen Übungen, in the exercises part, uh, you have uh, pure linguistic uh, skill building, there are dictations, there is foreign language essay writing, there is translation, which we feel is an advanced skill, where a skill which a foreign language teacher must master, not because he is supposed to use uh, translation as a method in uh, teaching the language. I mentioned last time in the time before that, 
that we consider uh, translation as a method of testing rather than teaching uh, language understanding and knowledge about the language and in the language. But we feel that the teacher himself must have a certain ability of putting a German text into the foreign language and a foreign language text into a good German uh, as a, uh, as, as, I, as I said, an advanced skill that he must master. There are uh, exercises, there are courses in grammar understanding where uh, certain delicate problems of foreign language grammar are studied. And again, I feel that the uh, teacher must have a very good understanding of uh, what you may call grammar or structure or whatever it is uh, of the makeup of the foreign language, even if he uh, does not plan to use very much of that in his uh, teaching, although I have mentioned that at least in the direct method you do get uh, inductive study of grammar even in the secondary school. There are in these exercise parts, of course, conversation courses and I may have forgotten some more. The uh, emphasis on linguistics in uh, all these different types of activities at the university again goes back to the uh, need that we feel that the teacher must be able to understand why certain things happen in a foreign language and why they happen differently in the foreign language from the way they happen in his own mother language. And we feel that this is necessary, that the teacher must understand that because he's going to have youngsters ask him questions about the foreign language and he must be able to answer these questions. A recent feature in uh, teacher education that has been introduced into our system after my own time is a kind of preliminary internships, uh, if I may use such a term. Uh, the students are required to go to a uh, school, or rather to various schools, and to observe teaching there. Uh, after having left the school for a certain time, they are expected to go to elementary schools and to secondary schools to observe the teaching there for four or six weeks, and at the end of such a period to teach a few classes themselves, just to get a little bit of the taste of what it means to be a teacher. The idea is that the uh, a teacher who might be a complete failure should be warned of the possibility of this happening uh, early enough. It, happens, uh, it doesn't happen very often that uh, students go uh, and leave their uh, vocation that they have felt so far, but we have had cases where uh, students uh, really could not be encouraged to go ahead with their teacher training and uh, it's not a very agreeable experience for anyone involved when you have to tell a student that. But I think it's better to tell it at this time while he's still studying and while he may still change his course of studies or, as you would possibly say, change his major rather than much later when it may be too late and we may, when he may not even have the time and the funds anymore to do anything else. I have already mentioned that the uh, teacher in Germany, uh, not only the foreign language teacher, but the teacher of uh, secondary uh, schools of the gymnasium, uh, is expected to be prepared in more than one subject. In my case, it happened to be French and English. It might have been a combination like English, German and history, or there are combinations like German as a mother language, plus history and geography, and so on. It's always more than one. Usually it is three subjects. French and English is one of the rare combinations where you have two because of the uh, different languages involved. You have to study for at least eight semesters in Germany before you can apply for going into the state examinations, a Staatsexamen. Actually, there are two different kinds of uh, Staatsexamen, the first and the second state examinations. Uh, this uh, first uh, examination that, that follows your study at the university is taken at the university, but it is not, as it were, an academic examination. It's actually entirely independent of the university. Well, entirely is not the right word. There are, let's put it this way, there are academic examinations, especially that of the PhD, 
Some universities in Germany have the uh, master's degree, magister. None have the bachelor. It just doesn't exist. It's a word you can't translate into German, except in the other meaning. Um, the, if you want to have an e academic examination, you usually prepare for the PhD. But uh, you do not have to have the PhD if you want to be a teacher. Quite a few teachers don't have the uh, PhD, and uh, quite a few PhD never, PhDs never plan to be teachers. So these, uh, two, uh, these are entirely independent from each other. Uh, a future teacher, however, must go through this uh, first state examination which is passed at the university, but the exam assignments come centrally to all the universities of a particular state from the Ministry of Education, uh, and more particularly of, from the Languages Department in the Ministry of Education. You might compare the German system to a school district in which each, each school district is identical with the state. So uh, the education is all centered in the uh, state capital, as it were, and in the Ministry of Education of the state capital. Uh, this uh, Ministry of Education sends the exam assignments to all the universities. The students take them all precisely at the same time, at the same minute even, of course, uh, to avoid any undesired communication from one university to the other. And uh, the um, uh, papers are then corrected by the local professors uh, of the local universities. And when they have been uh, corrected first by these local professors, then the whole bulk of papers is sent on to another uh, university, and there it is corrected again and uh, graded again by a different professor. The exams are passed anonymously. That is to say, you do not write your name on the paper, but you choose a, well, some kind of a term by which you want to be identified. And the professor, if he doesn't happen to know your handwriting, doesn't know whose paper he is grading. The uh, examination consists of uh, at least three main sections. The first section would be the Zulassungsarbeit. Uh, uh, to translate this, I would have to say something like applicatory thesis or admissibility thesis. It is a paper that you prepare and that you hand to your professor and that is graded by him and uh, somebody else even before you are admitted to take the real examination. The, uh, this uh, Zulassungsarbeit, this thesis, is in a way comparable to doctoral dissertations, but it is more uh, limited in its scope. The subject for such a thesis can be chosen by the student, or it can be assigned by a professor. In my particular case, uh, uh, I, choose my, I chose my subject. The way I chose it was perhaps interesting for people here in Minnesota. When I returned from my first stay in this country to Germany, uh, I had a, an interview with one of our professors, one of the leading uh, Angli Anglisten, uh, Professor Schücking, who was at that time in Erlangen. And he asked me about my experiences here in America. I told him that I had had uh, certain connections with various churches. And one of the questions that he shot at me was, now uh, tell me, do you feel that the description is a just one uh, that uh, Sinclair Lewis gives in Elma Gantry. Now, some of you may have read that book. I had not at that time. Uh, so I had to tell him that, and uh, that ended this particular question. But I got curious, and uh, I found that book, and I read it. And I found that it was not exactly, let's say, a uh, sociological case report. Uh, and I got interested in it, uh, being interested in this problem uh, anyhow. So I could choose the subject. Now, how did I uh, word it? Religionskritik uh, und Satire, I think it was. Uh, uh, criticism of religion and satire in Sinclair Lewis's Elmer Gantry. I mention this because it shows the relation that a, a Zulassungsarbeit can have to a doctoral dissertation. My own dissertation was enlarged from this beginning to cover uh, the whole body of Sinclair Lewis's novel, and I wrote about uh, uh, religious criticism in the novels of Sinclair Lewis. So uh, actually, this Zulassungsarbeit, with some changes, of course, became one chapter of my uh, dissertation. It can work the other way around, too. Some students who uh, 
manage to have their uh, doctoral dissertation very soon uh, can use that at the same time as the admiss admissibility thesis or I don't know is there any term anything that corresponds it sounds such as like such a strange term to you say that but I think you uh, understand the idea of this thesis being used to prove a certain amount of uh, research done independently by the candidate for the state examination. The second part of the state examinations is a uh, battery of written tests consisting of uh, first a, a modern, um, a mother language essay on a general subject. This is actually the uh, type of essay that is demanded from any candidate for uh, uh, teaching at a secondary school, not only from the foreign language teacher. It's a general uh, subject essay in the mother language. Then there is a, an essay to be written in the foreign language. I remember one subject that was uh, given uh, that the student, of course, doesn't know anything about beforehand. It was uh, one of the subjects that could be chosen at that time. I think usually there are six of which one must, chosen, must be chosen. The pastimes of an educated person is one that I happen to remember. Uh, to show, to give the student a chance to express himself in the foreign language. Then there is an essay, Fachaufsatz, uh, uh, an essay more on research subject, it should, I should say, which is written in the mother language. It is about either a subject in uh, linguistics or a subject in literature or a subject in cultural background. As a matter of fact, at the time when I took the examinations, these things change a little bit every once in a while, but uh, at that time they gave three uh, subjects in uh, linguistics, three subjects uh, on literature and three subjects uh, on cultural background, so you really had a wide choice what you wanted to write about. I think it's not a very good idea, really. I think a student uh, and a future teacher should uh, prove his uh, ability to uh, talk about these uh, about each of these subjects rather than about one of the three groups of subjects. The uh, problem of writing this in the mother language, I think, is one that uh, will uh, be considered interesting here. I think we are trying at least to be realistic. Uh, most of our courses, or many of our courses on linguistics, on literature and on uh, even some on the cultural background, are uh, given in the mother language. In uh, the publication about the education of the modern foreign language teacher for American schools, I found an interesting uh, reason and, uh, given for anything done in this way, and I think it's the reason that we feel is, a va is the valid thing to be said here. In this report about the NDEA institutes, it is said that at most of the institutes which the visitors observed, two classes were given in English, that is to say here in the mother language, of course, the linguistics class and the methods class. In one case, our visitor asked the director why the class in linguistics was given in English. The director replied, that the teaching of linguistics in French or Spanish would, in a sense, be presenting two unknowns in one equation. <laughs> and I think it is true. It sounds very good when you say that you are teaching all your courses in the foreign language. And I think it's a very good idea when you think that the foreign language as such is the most important thing. But when you begin to feel that the literature or the subject in linguistics is more important for the time of this course, then uh, the uh, mastery of the foreign language, I think you will uh, realize that there are quite a few students who uh, would not understand your message about linguistics if you presented it in the foreign language, even about literature. I think uh, uh, you, well, it's a decision you make, but I, if you think that you really want your student to understand everything you say, you will choose the mother language. Maybe this is, sounds too realistic for you, but that's the way we do it. Another one of the uh, written papers that you have to uh, prepare in the course of these examinations, which, by the way, last about two weeks, 
is a historical interpretation of foreign language texts, in which you show your understanding of the historical development of the language. I remember in uh, my examination there was a passage from Beowulf, certain words and certain uh, uh, expressions, certain uh, syntactical uh, patterns had to be explained uh, in the uh, Old English text. Uh, for one thing, the, the text had to be uh, translated. Uh, it had to be uh, explained historically, uh, certain words, certain patterns, as I said. And then also there's a text from the modern language in which you go back and uh, show the, from which sources, etymological sources and so on, certain words or also certain structures would come. Uh, most students dislike this very much. So did I. Uh, in my teaching practice uh, since that time, I have found out that having uh, learned to understand the history of a language gives you certain clues to help students to understand certain aspects of the foreign language. You would not want to uh, repeat your uh, historical grammar in secondary school, of course not. But uh, let me give you one practical example. Uh, German students of English usually have a terrible time find, uh, deciding where to put the H in words like eight or night, especially after they have been drilled in the TH spelling and sound. Sound and spelling, I should say. Uh, sound comes before the spelling. <coughs> but when I tell them that in many cases, although not in all, but in many cases, uh, the English spelling GH corresponds historically to uh, the German spelling CH, it helps them uh, to understand, for one thing, that spelling is a very arbitrary thing. That one uh, nation can decide to spell the sound sh, which certainly existed in Old English, by using certain letters, and that other nations may use different letters, ch in German. And then, uh, usually, uh, one explanation like this solves most of the problems of words like uh, night or eight or light and so on, because we have Nacht, Ach, Licht, and so on in German. And this is a, a very easy way of helping the students. Uh, you must have a certain stock of historical knowledge from which to draw, and certainly you will not be able to use all this stock of uh, knowledge about the historical development of the language in your own teaching, but it's surprising what you can sometimes use, and it also helps the students to understand one thing which we think is important, that is uh, that things can be explained and must be seen in historical perspective. And this uh, helps them uh, in the field of languages to understand this a little bit. Another part of the written examinations in the state exam examination is our dictations. Actually, there were two. I remember one was a prose dictation and one was a poetry dictation in which you had to identify the form of poetry that happened to be used. The written examinations were uh, graded and if you had not yet flunked already, uh, you were uh, sent into the orals. <coughs> uh, there are 60 minutes of oral exams. One third of the uh, 60 minutes goes into a uh, examination of the practical mastery of the language and of an understanding of the cultural background. Another third, that is to say another 20 minutes, goes into an oral e examination about linguistics. And the third part is about literature. Another uh, oral examination that is connected not only with the foreign language teacher examination but with all teacher examinations for the uh, gymnasium is the philosophicum, that is to say an oral exam about philosophy in which you must show a certain general understanding of, of philosophical concepts and a um, deeper understanding of one or two philosophers whom you may have studied more thoroughly. And a pedagogicum that is to say, uh, this is a newer feature, by the way, uh, a, um, a, a oral examination again, in which you show that you have uh, followed certain courses and understood their content about uh, general pedagogics. When you have uh, successfully passed all these examinations, you leave the university. And your teacher training does not necessarily 
take you back to the university anymore. To get the second part, the practical part of your teacher training in Germany, you go to a teacher training seminar which uh, has no administrative connection with university but rather a very close uh, administrative connection with secondary schools. At certain gymnasien, uh, they have these studies seminars, as they call them, Studienseminare. Uh, usually there is more than one seminar at a school. There might be one, for example, for teachers, future teachers of French and English, and another one for future teachers of math and physics, and possibly another one for future teachers of, uh, let's say, gymnastics and biology, or whatever the combinations may be. I happen to come from a, from a gymnasium, the Hardenberg Gymnasium in Fürth, uh, which has uh, for many years been what we call a Seminarschule, that is to say a gymnasium with a uh, number of seminars uh, uh, attached to it. The uh, advantage is that the teachers are in immediate connection with the practical aspect of teaching at the gymnasium through from grades uh, 5 through 13, that is to say, nine different uh, levels. They get, uh, the students get a variety of experience, and this variety of experience is necessary and required because they may be teaching at any of these levels. Uh, I don't know, I'm not quite aware how uh, teacher preparation goes on here. I don't know uh, whether a teacher can be considered to be a teacher of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, junior uh, high school only, or whether he would be a teacher always of the senior high school. Anyhow, in Germany he would be expected to be able to teach at any grade of the gymnasium. The uh, administrative setup of the seminar affiliated with such a gymnasium would be this. Uh, the head of the seminar, the director as it were, is usually the principal of that gymnasium too. He is at the same time the teacher for uh, what you call general methods. Uh, he trains the uh, referendare, the student teachers, we call them referendare, in uh, general psychology and general pedagogy and so on. In each particular uh, subject seminar, there are certain seminar teachers. For example, there would be three if the combination were German geography and history. In my particular case, uh, with English and French, there would be two. There is one special methods teacher for English and one special methods teacher for French. It might happen that the special methods teacher uh, might himself be a teacher who teaches both these subjects. And then he can also be the special methods teacher for the two subjects. But uh, usually there are two different uh, a special method teachers. And then you have the referendare, the student teachers themselves, usually a group between eight and ten, very small groups. The special method teachers and the uh, head of the seminar have quite a bit of freedom in organizing uh, the uh, setup of the teaching, of the uh, teacher training. In my uh, own training, I remember we first were given a few weeks of observation and discussion in various classes, not only in foreign language classes, but we were supposed to get a new view at the schools. It might have been the schools where we had been students ourselves. But we uh, were now given leisure to look at certain aspects uh, of the school from the teacher point of view. And at the, at the same time, the teaching of general methods and of special methods would begin. Uh, this is a, an activity that uh, fills the whole of the first year, this uh, learning about general and special methods. In the general methods course, the uh, referendare would get uh, various uh, uh, introductions to different philosophies of education, historical uh, this, uh, systems of education, to mention only one would be uh, Comenius, for example, who more or less developed the audio-visual approach in the 17th century. I think one good thing about this historical approach to general education 
is that you begin to know the tradition of which you are about to become a member. You learn to see yourself in perspective and you begin to realize that as a teacher you have a certain background and a rather firm ground to stand on in the storm of scientific controversy that seems to be going on at all times in the development of new ideas about teaching. In the special methods course, the uh, referendare, the student teachers, uh, get also introduction uh, to certain classroom procedures and, of course, uh, there are discussions of the relevancy or irrelevancy of certain classroom procedures. After a few weeks of general observation in the first year, the students uh, will get a chance to do some uh, practice teaching under observation. The way it was done in my own seminar was very, very efficient. Uh, all the eight members of our seminar went into the same classroom to observe the student teacher. It uh, proved very successful for mutual criticism, candid criticism. We all wanted to help uh, one another. We all were sitting in the same boat. And uh, I think it was one of the most helpful learning uh, situations that I've ever encountered. Uh, the uh, student, the colleagues, for example, the other referendare, could observe the class and see reactions that I, as a teacher standing in front of the class, may have ignored, especially in the nervousness of these first teaching assignments. And they would tell me about them. They would give me suggestions how to do things better. This, I think, is one of the uh, most efficient uh, methods that can be used in the training of a teacher. Of course, uh, you might get uh, groups where, the, uh, where jealousies could develop. I don't know. I've never seen anything uh, like that happen. and I like to think back of that experience as one of the most uh, enjoyable times in my teacher training. Uh, there was always subsequent discussion, if not immediately after the course, then uh, one or two days later, but in special reference to each individual course that had been taught by a student teacher. As a matter of fact, before we were given a chance to do some student teaching of our own, we were present in classes, in regular school classes, that were taught by our seminar special methods teacher. The special methods teacher was at the same time a regular teacher at the gymnasium with regular classes assigned to them. And uh, I think this also was a very healthy situation. Uh, for one thing, anything can go wrong with any teacher. And uh, it helps the students to understand the problems, and it helps the uh, uh, seminar teacher, the special methods teacher, to understand the problems of his students. And I think this, again, is a very, very useful arrangement. Uh, after a certain while, the uh, uh, other student teachers would not be present anymore. They would be getting uh, more constant assignments. They would be uh, told to teach uh, one class, for example, for six weeks. That's the regular procedure. And then the observation would only be by what you call the cooperating teacher, that is to say, the teacher who really is in charge of a particular class, of a particular course, I think I should say. Uh, every once in a while, the special methods teacher might drop in without having announced his coming and uh, take some notes and get a general impression of the ability of the student teacher. And I think the discussions between the cooperating teacher and the student teacher after uh, many of these uh, individual experiences can be very fruitful too. And uh, you can learn a lot from the experience of somebody who is not really the one who is going to give you grades and who may uh, be a little bit uh, more inclined to be frank with you about in telling you about your mistakes because uh, you yourself would feel that after all, it's not so bad. This is not going to count against me. And he, after all, is trying to help me. Of course, uh, the special methods teacher just as well tries to help me. But it's uh, a little bit harder to take criticism from somebody who is going to fix your grade. 
So, uh, well, you, of course, you have the same situation of uh, cooperating teachers helping, or sometimes perhaps not helping, the student teacher. And this is very much a personal pro uh, question of how well a cooperating teacher and a student teacher may get along with one another. The uh, referenda, the student teacher, will be expected to be partially responsible for such a period of six weeks for at least two different classes subsequent, subsequently, uh, usually even for more than two different uh, classes or courses. And the student teacher will have a schedule of uh, about 12 hours a week on an average when he gets to the second half of his first year in student teacher training at the seminar at the gymnasium. After a while, the cooperating teacher will leave him alone. And the student teacher will be present in the class without anybody there. And uh, I think this is the time when the uh, student teacher begins to understand the importance of discipline problems. Unfortunately, the uh, pupils at the uh, various gymnasiums where we have seminars are very much aware of the status of the student teacher and their discipline is according. Uh, but the student uh, teacher must be left alone with them for a while, uh, if only sometimes to dampen his optimism about his own <laughs> achievement. <laughs> Uh, you get different personalities all the time, of course. <clears throat> and uh, the uh, classroom teacher, of course, is available. The regular classroom teacher, the cooperating teacher, is available uh, to come in and help the student teacher whenever there are any serious problems. The student teacher would be getting opportunities to do this kind of independent teaching intermittently from the third to the tenth month of his first year in uh, student teacher training. In the second year of his student teacher training, which lasts two full academic years, the uh, student teachers uh, are sent to a different school. The idea being that they are to get as much variety in teaching situations as possible. Possibly they may even be sent to, do, to two different kinds of schools during uh, this second year. And he will be doing some uh, teaching under uh, observation and some teaching without observation at each of those schools. Uh, during his whole uh, time as a student teacher, by the way, he gets a certain very limited amount of income. You might call it a kind of internship. It was very, very low at the time when I started. Uh, at that time, uh, the, you only got a kind of... Uh, Unterhaltszuschuss, a support to live on if, you, if your parents uh, could not be expected to pay all your income and all your needs. I remember at my, uh, uh, one uh, student teacher in my group got as much as 40 marks per month, which would be $20 as far as income is concerned. Uh, for myself, it was very little more than that. Uh, today, the, this situation has uh, very much improved, and the student teachers uh, today get something comparable to 150 to $200 per month during this internship, during the whole of the two years. I think it's a little bit more during the second year. While the uh, student uh, teacher is out at different schools, which usually are not seminar schools, but are schools to which no uh, student teacher seminar is affiliated, that is to say student schools where the uh, uh, discipline problem is usually not as difficult to handle as it is at the seminar school. Uh, during this time, the student teachers go back to their uh, main school, to their trunk school, Stammschule, we call it, uh, for discussions once every month. And uh, they meet their special methods teacher. They have opportunities to talk uh, about problems that they have encountered about problems possibly of cooperation with the uh, local teachers at the branch schools, Zweigschulen, we say, uh, or uh, problems in special methods in presenting certain things. 
and uh, there are discussions for one day and then they go back. The advantage of this whole organization, I think, is using the words of the guidelines here, that the future teacher acquires theory not prior to practice teaching, but in conjunction with it, so that theory and experience can illuminate each other. And I think it's a very su successful aspect of our teacher training uh, program. I've already mentioned that the special methods teacher is at the same time a classroom teacher in the subject uh, whose teaching methods he represents and that he is observed by the student teachers and that the student teachers, uh, if this man is anything like a personality, are free to ask questions about his methods and possibly even to criticize his methods. He, uh, this uh, special methods teacher his, is his own demonstration teacher and his own cooperating teacher, at least during the beginning part of the student teacher training. This is possible because the uh, studies seminar, the student teacher training seminar, uh, is a germane branch of the institution which also provides the laboratory experience for the student teacher. And theoretical and practical training go hand in hand. I think I uh, should like to quote about the advisability of this method, again, from the uh, book which I mentioned a moment ago, The Education of the Modern Foreign Language uh, Teacher for American Schools, Joseph Axelrod. He writes about this setup, and I quote certain passages only, uh, and he uh, reports again about the NDEA Foreign Language Institutes. The methods course and the demonstration class were conceived at the institutes as integral parts of one process. The same thing could be said about our setup back home. While theory was by no means minimized, it was always supported by practice. The methods class, the demonstration class, and the commentary and analysis, which in many cases took place before and after each demonstration class section, with both instructor and participants taking part, served to weld these elements into an integrated instrument of true professional preparation. The study group found this general pattern successful and recommends that it be taken as a model for regular teacher education program. I certainly can subscribe to that. Another advantage in this setup is that the future student teacher meets quite a number of different cooperating teachers. He meets different personalities, he meets different approaches, and this again helps him very much to uh, judge about his own ability and about his own method. <coughs> when the two years come to an end, the uh, student teacher passes his so-called second state examinations, the Zweite Staatsexamen. As a matter of fact, he has uh, passed part of that exam during his training, that is to say, he has gone through three periods of examination teaching hours. After he has uh, received a certain amount of training, usually the first of these uh, teaching examinations is at the end of his first year as a teacher training. He will teach a class, a regular class that he has known, in the presence of a committee composed of the head of the seminar, who is the principal of the school, and the special methods teacher, and his classroom teacher, the cooperating teacher. He uh, is expected to hand in a lesson outline, and uh, he uh, is, uh, of course, given a chance to talk about his projects with his special methods teachers, so that he selects something that really uh, shows his ability of doing certain things that he must know. One usual procedure uh, for foreign language teachers is that they go at least through one uh, lesson, demonstration lesson, in which they show the presentation of new vocabulary as it, ha as it is usually done in the direct method. Some of you may remember what I told about two weeks ago, about the direct method and the way we introduce vocabulary without using the mother language and without giving the translation of the foreign word to be explained. This is uh, one standard procedure 
for a uh, examination classroom period. After this uh, demonstration lesson, uh, immediately afterwards, this committee establishes a grade after this jury has had a certain discussion about what they have seen, about general methods, about special methods, and so on. And this uh, grade goes on record together with two more. As I said, there are three examinations in practical teaching. And these gr uh, three grades are supplemented by a general grade supplied by the special methods teacher who has been observing each of his students regularly throughout the first and second, well, throughout the first year, actually, uh, because uh, during the second year the teachers may be out. But the second and third examinations in practical teaching usually take place at the branch school, that is to say at the school where the uh, student teacher was during his second year. When uh, these three uh, parts uh, of the examination are passed, the uh, student also hands in another applicatory thesis, another two lessons arbeit, to show his understanding of certain pedagogical or psychological problems and insights. The subjects can be manifold for these uh, theses. For example, it can be the evaluation of a textbook that has recently appeared on the market, or it can be a discussion of certain methodological problems. Uh, an example of what I did myself, just to uh, show you the scope of what can be done in these theses, I wrote a, an, an evaluation of the honor system as I had encountered it at Hamilton College. I had spent one year in uh, 49 and 50, which was uh, quite an interesting subject for uh, my German uh, special methods teacher. And uh, the question, of course, was uh, what makes such a system work and uh, could it be applied in Germany? There is no written examination during, uh, for the, uh, the second state examinations apart from this thesis. There is an oral examination uh, before a board uh, of, uh, consisting of the head of the seminar and a representative from the uh, Ministry of Education and possibly some more people, depending on the situation. Um, your uh, grades in practical teaching, that is to say all your grades that have been given for your student-teacher training, are compounded with your grades from the university, that is to say, from the uh, first state examination to form a final grade. And this grade is quite important because the Ministry of Education, in Bavaria at least, accepts only candidates, not uh, who have uh, passed, but who have attained a 2.5 average in, uh, their, uh, in the overall picture of their grades. I have not uh, said anything in particular uh, now about the teacher training for intermediate schools or for elementary schools. Uh, the teacher training for elementary schools has separate institutions, the so-called pedagogische Hochschulen, pedagogical academies or colleges, they may, might be called, with a program of their own. The uh, preparation of a teacher for foreign languages at, a, at an intermediate school, Mittelschule or Realschule as we call it now, uh, is uh, the same as that for a teacher at a gymnasium, except that some of the requirements are not quite as high. You have fewer seminars to attend. You do not have cert to take certain written tests in the first state board examination, and so on. And of course, you attend a different kind of teacher seminar. In service training, uh, after you have become a full-fledged teacher, is uh, not in any way formalized or uh, thoroughly organized. Especially, there is no formalized credit system connected with it. And uh, the pay of a teacher does not depend on the amount of in-service training that he gets. Certain courses are offered, of course, especially during the holidays, during the vacations. Also, there are certain travel stipends, tra travel scholarships for foreign language teachers who want to attend courses abroad. And I think these can be considered as quite an incentive to attend such a course, uh, because after all, it's always a financial problem, even for teachers in Europe, to be going to foreign countries. 
I know it's very much a problem for teachers in America, but then after all, once you have had your main expenditure about the travel, your dollar goes quite far when you are in Europe. And I think that's uh, kind of just... Uh, the uh, courses that you, are at, uh, that you have attended, uh, and for which you may have, may have received certain certificates, do go on record in a more informal way. Uh, the, your school principal will have to write a, an evaluation of your work every three years, and this evaluation certainly does influence uh, certain kinds of advancements, uh, which again have an influence on the pay. But uh, the courses attended, and I think this is true for the whole system, beginning from the elementary school through gymnasium and university to the teacher training. The courses attended are not the important thing, are not considered as the basis uh, for uh, accreditation. Rather, it is the achievement shown, the achievement shown in examinations. From the Reife Prüfung, uh, the uh, high school graduation examination, which is a full week exam, to the um, uh, uh, first and second state examinations. Some short criticism of this system should be made. For example, at the gymnasium, at the uh, final examination of the, at the high school level, we do not have uh, oral examinations for the students in foreign languages except for those who have uh, D- minus or F grades. And I think this is a mistake. I think there should be oral exams to test the oral skills for all students. At the universities, I already said, uh, they refuse to uh, take into consideration the uh, preparation for a certain profession. And I think some uh, approach might be made in that direction. Of course, uh, as I said, the students are supposed to be mature enough to practice the foreign language, for example, on their own. The university doesn't help you very much to learn a foreign language, and it would be uh, surprising to see anybody trying to become a foreign language teacher in a subject which he began to study at the university. Some of the emphases may be wrong, especially as far as linguistics is concerned. There should be more general information about the foreign countries, and I think uh, there should be a certain amount of sociology required from, from each uh, future teacher of a uh, foreign language, so sociology based especially about the foreign countries. There should be courses about the history of the foreign countries because usually we have uh, had our course in world history, and uh, that's all we have. We have a very uh, we have uh, a centralized course in the meaning that our own home country is the center of the world, and all the other countries come in sporadically and intermittently. I think a foreign language teacher should have had an opportunity to study history such as it is understood by, let's say, a high school student in France and a high school student in Spain, to get his picture of the world. I th and I think the history course is uh, very important here. The stay in a foreign country is not compulsory. And I think uh, the main problem really is that there would be legal problems connected with it. If you oblige students to go to the foreign countries, you will have to give them a, an opportunity. Uh, at the same time, it's true that uh, the proof of having spent a year abroad doesn't really prove anything, because uh, you never know how well the time abroad has been used. And of course, there is some checking up in the oral exams of the first uh, state examinations. Some criticism that could be uh, stated about the seminars, I think that the purely scientific approach to psychology and pedagogy would not hurt during these two years. Uh, the uh, approach certainly is to include some of this uh, as far as the uh, teacher of general methods is concerned, but he's too much a man standing in the practice of school life not to include the practical aspect at all times. And I think uh, also he uh, usually, as the head of a school, has too many duties to really be a good uh, head of the seminar at the same time. Maybe these two functions should be separated. I'm trying to anticipate some of your questions and criticism. Uh, some uh, remarks after having discussed our own system of teacher education. Let me add a few remarks on American systems of teacher education. 
which I feel I owe you and which I feel I also owe uh, to my particular assignment here as a foreign, as a foreign, foreign language consultant. What has created a very deep impression on my mind is the fact that the subject of foreign language teaching and the subject of foreign language teacher training in the United States is one that marshals much attention today. The impact of the dramatic advance of the foreign language teaching programs at various levels in this country has certainly made itself felt in the field of foreign language teacher training. And I don't think I have now to uh, outline the general similarities between our program and yours. You have noticed them all along. I'll just mention some of the things that struck me as surprising. I mentioned one of them already. Uh, uh, it, is, it was to see that a student could come to a college, for example, and begin studying a foreign language there, and then after four years be considered a teacher of that foreign language. I do realize that he, may be, uh, he or she may be doing much more intensive work uh, in his field than a student might be doing uh, at a German university, but at the same time I think that it takes a certain amount of time for a language to go into your system, and I think that the better time to begin uh, this uh, acquaintance with a foreign language is uh, when you are much younger than uh, when you enter a college. Uh, in uh, the German uh, system of education, uh, you must have uh, attended a uh, gymnasium if you want to go to a university, or rather you must have passed the uh, gymnasium finals, whatever preparation you may have had, there are several ways of getting them, as a matter of fact. Uh, but uh, these examinations include uh, tests in two foreign languages. You must have proved a certain uh, ability and achievement in two foreign languages before you are admitted to any study in, uh, at the university, not only foreign language teaching, but uh, even, let's say, uh, medicine or physics. Uh, one thing uh, that I uh, think is also surprising is to have uh, uh, special methods courses for several languages at a time. I think uh, there are so many institutions here. As a matter of fact, we have uh, in our committee uh, talked about it. I think it, uh, there should be uh, efforts to give uh, students uh, a training which includes examples in, their, in the language with which they themselves understand and not examples about a foreign language which they have no knowledge about. And uh, this uh, possibly is a suggestion that I could make here. I think that uh, the uh, linguistic understanding about a language is a very important thing. Call it grammar analysis or call it what you like, it is necessary for a foreign language teacher. Uh, because, as I said, a teacher must give explanations. Uh, here, let me quote uh, from the teacher of modern foreign languages by Theodore Anderson, who writes uh, about a certain uh, stage in uh, foreign language teaching. The pupil thus becomes conscious of correct or appropriate usage, by a pattern drill, I mean. But there is no explanation of grammar, no talking about language. Gradually, the pupils realize that at this stage, the question why makes no sense. That the answer is always the same, because this is the way speakers of Russian say it. He had been giving examples from Russian. Uh, this, uh, we feel, is the very opposite of what the education of a young man should be like. Uh, because the student certainly will go on asking the question why. You can fail to give him an, uh, to supply him with an answer, but he certainly is trying to find an answer on his own, and it may be all wrong and he may be getting into all kinds of mistakes through that. And I think uh, we should not try systematically to frustrate intelligent curiosity. I do not think that the student should be expected to recite grammar rules. Don't misunderstand me. And uh, very often when we give explanations, we will tell the students, well, now you can't forget about that. The only thing is that you can handle the language correctly. But having given an explanation will help the student to handle uh, uh, the language. Also, I was surprised to see at, uh, certain, uh, in certain publications a discussion of a problem whether a subject matter should be emphasized in, in uh, student-teacher training or whether methods should be emphasized. I do not think that is a question of uh, either or. It is a question of both and. 
And I think you can train a very excellent uh, interpreter who uh, beautifully masters the language, but who will never be able to be a good uh, teacher if he is not given the training. And you can train an excellent teacher who knows all the ideas of pedagogy, but uh, if, you, if he doesn't master the language, uh, he cannot be a good language teacher either. So actually both things are absolutely necessary, in our opinion. Native speakers, especially, should not be considered as uh, uh, potential teachers merely because of their fluent command of a language. At least they should be given some training in how to teach the language. Also, uh, I think the problems of articulation and cooperation are important. As I mentioned, I feel that uh, the fact that the uh, teacher training goes on at, a unit, at a, an institution where we have the, uh, the pupils for nine years certainly helps, and it helps uh, the um, uh, uh, special methods teacher to make arrangements for class visits. I have very often here, when we prepared uh, visits to student teachers, heard remarks like this. After all, you must not forget that it is a favor to us if a high school accepts our student teachers. In my opinion, this is an intolerable limitation to any uh, student teacher training program. And I think there should be uh, some system uh, which uh, would provide for very close cooperation and articulation. Uh, one uh, possible solution might be the uh, university high school that I saw but uh, I do not think it is a very good solution because any special institution will tend to be non-typical after a certain while. There will be certain situations that the student teacher would not account in his uh, future uh, practice. Possibly larger units would have to be created, including private colleges, possibly even on the state basis, uh, in which this cooperation uh, between the high schools, who after all depend on the teacher training institutions, and the teacher training institutions could be assured. Also, I think the guidelines for state certification should be closer to the guidelines worked out by the profession in recommendations like this one of the MLA. Finally, I think we all, and this applies both uh, to uh, my country and to yours, we all have to overcome a kind of sectarianism in foreign language teacher training. We should not set up a cult of one theory, of one theory of linguistics, of one theory of behaviorism, or one theory of anything else. We should know many, or if possible, all the current different approaches. Again, we should try and see ourselves in perspective. We should see ourselves as following one of many possibilities rather than consider ourselves as doing the only possible thing. And we should be able to use various methods when and where we feel fit to do so. As it is said here in the education of the modern foreign language teacher, the most effective methods courses in the institute therefore were those which made it possible for each participant to work out and perfect the techniques which were right for his particular teaching conditions and for his particular temperamental strengths and weaknesses. This is here supposed to be a, an explanation of the audiolingual approach to foreign language teaching. But I think uh, at this point, actually, we go beyond any particular approach and we go to teaching as such. Uh, when all has been said, I think teaching must become unmethodical. We certainly must give our students methods but uh, the student who always, and all through his life, the teacher, let's say, who all through his life prepares a lesson plan uh, for each of his lessons, and who follows this lesson plan, is apt not to be the best possible teacher. He should master his techniques rather than be mastered by them. He certainly must prepare his material and must have them ready, but I think he must also be able to shift from his lesson plan and from his goal to what may prove to be necessary in a given classroom situation. And I think this is where we really begin to be teachers rather than persons trying to handle teaching methods. And I think this is what we should aim at. Thank you very much for your patience. It's been very much.